okay, there's quite a bit of data backing it up. Now, sometimes you may see really squiggly spectral noise density plots, and typically that doesn't indicate that there's something wrong with the amplifier. It just means that the folks measuring the plot um, were under the gun to publish the data sheet probably and uh, didn't spend uh, a huge amount of time to actually get a nice uh, smooth curve. One thing to point out is that uh, we also spec the voltage noise density typically in our data sheet table, uh, and that'll be specified at a specific frequency. So for example, uh, again using the ASU95, uh, we spec it at one kilohertz, and that is the exact same point. So if you were to go look at the typical performance curve at one kilohertz, you'd see that it is at 40 nanovolts per root hertz. Uh, that number typically comes from the flat point of the graph. Um, we're going to talk about 1 over F noise here in a little bit, and uh, the number that's in the day sheet is always done in the white noise part of the graph. Okay, so you'll notice on uh, the spectral noise density plot that we're talking about, you'll notice that upward sloping curve there on the left uh, where the noise density gets bigger as your frequency gets lower, and that's called the 1 over F noise region, and this is a common uh, behavior in amplifiers. So you'll, you'll find this in the vast majority of amplifiers. One exception that you may not see is in auto zero or chopping amplifiers. Uh, these amplifiers typically have circuitry that uh, nulls out the offset, and because this 1 over F noise is so slow, it sort of looks like an offset to the chopping or auto zero frequency, and so it gets nulled, it gets nulled out as well. So that's a nice feature of auto zero or chopper. Uh, amplifiers, but for a standard normal amplifier, you'll almost always see this 1 over F performance. And this 1 over F uh, noise may start at a uh, maybe more or less prevalent depending on the process that the uh, part is designed with. Then you have this other region, uh, which is the white noise region, which is just the flat part of the region and is where, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we spec in our data sheet table uh, that, that number. Uh, that's in the white noise region. So if you draw a line from the 1 over F line and the white noise line, where they intersect is called the noise corner. And this noise corner is a figure of merit. It's typically not specified on a data sheet, but you may hear some old uh, engineer talk about it and, and you wonder what he's talking about. And this is, this is what it is. So uh, the noise corner is a figure of merit for uh, an amplifier. So if you're measuring, trying to measure low frequency signals, you want as little 1 over F noise as possible. So you want an amplifier with a low noise corner. Um, typically, uh, processes that are designed for very high speeds have very poor 1 over F no uh, noise corners because the trade-offs that we have to make in our process to lower the capacitance and uh, get faster transistor speeds often are detrimental to 1 over F noise performance. So uh, as a general rule, really high-speed amplifiers have poor 1 over F noise, and precision amplifiers have good 1 over F noise but aren't too fast. So we talked about these different units. Now it would be actually useful to figure out how to go between these different units so that, say, if you have something expected in anvils per root hertz, how do you get to a point where you can actually determine what's actually going to show up on your scope? So the way that you would do this is uh, you go from the spectral noise density, or nanovolts per hertz, to the RMS noise. So that's the first step. And then you would go from RMS noise to peak to peak. So that's how you would go from spectral density to something that you could see on your oscilloscope in this peak to peak. All right, so the theory uh, behind going from spectral noise density to RMS is this. What you would need to do is you would need to integrate at tiny points uh, along, you know, you need to go along the curve and at each, you know, DF part of the curve you figure out what the spectral density is, uh, you do that integration, uh, you take the square root. Uh, I've done this, I've actually, the way you would do this in normal life is um, you can actually go into Excel and for you know, at 1 hertz, you can say, okay, here's what my spectral uh, density number is. Okay, 1.5 hertz, here's what it is at 2 hertz. And you can go along the graph, and you can actually plug that into Excel, and you can get a quite accurate uh, number 
where you figure out what they are and then you sum them all together with the sum of squares uh, using this equation here. Uh, however, that tends to be pretty tedious and I think is overkill for the vast majority of applications. So, uh, and here, oh, we've got a little picture here of you integrating these different little pieces. Uh, but I would say that this is too complicated. A uh, much simpler way to do this is we just assume that basically that 1 over F noise doesn't exist, so we just say, okay, we're going to draw a box. And this is a safe assumption if the 1 over F corner is much less than the bandwidth uh, that you're trying to measure. So um, if your 1 over F corner is, say, at 20 hertz uh, and you've got a 10 kilohertz signal, then uh, that's plenty good enough to just make this assumption. Remember, even though on the curve it looks like you've got a big portion that we're not measuring, remember that this is a logarithmic curve. So even though, you know, from 1 to 10 hertz or 1 to 100 hertz, uh, it looks like we're m missing that big triangle there. If you compare that 100 hertz span to the 10 kilohertz that we're actually measuring, it's a pretty insignificant portion of the total noise. So this is a safe assumption in this case. So if you do that, then all you got to do is you just uh, multiply the spectral density, which you can get from the data sheet table or you can read uh, from, from the graph here, and you multiply that by the square root of the bandwidth. And that's why it's always called nanovolts per, per root hertz, is because you've got the square root. So just remember to take the square root of the bandwidth, multiply it by the spectral density, and there you go, you've got your RMS noise. Now, when we made that last calculation, uh, we made the assumption that you've got a brick wall filter, so that you know you've got your 10 kilohertz filter, and this 10 kilohertz filter is fantastic, lets everything through up to 10 kilohertz, and then nothing after that. In real life, you don't typically have a brick wall filter. You typically have you know, something that looks more like this. So this would be an example of a uh, one pole filter, and this one pole filter, you'll notice, lets stuff through. Uh, after 10 kilohertz. So there's extra noise that comes through with this filter. There's also a little bit that the filter cuts off before, um, but uh, mostly what this filter does is it lets more noise through than the ideal brick wall filter. And we can actually, uh, smarter folks than me have actually gone and figured out uh, that for a one pole filter, uh, the amount of noise that's let in is 1.57 times uh, the uh, noise of a brick wall filter. And if you had a two-pole filter, it would be 1.11. If a three-pole, 1.05. So you'll notice as you increase the order of your filter, it gets closer and closer to a brick wall, uh, and so it gets closer and closer to one. So if you had an ideal brick wall filter, the equivalent noise bandwidth is just, just one. Uh, also, I want to point out that these numbers that I show here are for Butterworth filters. You have separate numbers for uh, Bessel filter or Chebyshev, and depending even on the type of Chebyshev, you'll have different equivalent noise bandwidths. So if you want to be really accurate in what you're doing, um, then you can go look up the equivalent noise bandwidth for your specific filter. Uh, typically, you know, when you're trying to do noise calculations, uh, what you do is if you've got a one-pole filter, you use the 1.57, and if you have something more than a one-pole filter, you just say that it's close enough and we just assume that my equivalent noise bandwidth is 1. Uh, so that's for quick and dirty calculations. So here we've got a, an example. Uh, so using the 40 nanovolts per root hertz uh, of this plot, let's say we have a 10 kilohertz one pole filter. The way you do it is you just multiply that 10 kilohertz by 1.57, you take the square root, you multiply it by the 40 nanovolts per root hertz, and you end up getting 5 microvolts RMS. So that's, that's a real life example of how you do it. Now, what do you do if uh, we can't use our assumption that we talked about before? So before we said, okay, our 1 over F corner is much lower than our bandwidth, so we'll just use, uh, we'll ignore that 1 over F stuff, and we'll just assume that everything is white and just use our shortcut formula. But let's say that we're near the 1 over F corner with our bandwidth. Say we have a 100 hertz uh, bandwidth. Then, then what do we do? Well, uh, one thing you could do is you go back and use that theoretical formula. That's one thing you can do. Um, another thing that you should make sure and do is that you're using actually an amplifier with a low 1 over F corner. So I want to give an example of two different parts here. 
And if you look on the front page of the day sheet of both the 8698 and the 8691, uh, you'll notice that both of them have exactly the same white noise number. So both of them are 8 nanovolts per hertz. But if you actually go and look at the typical performance curves, you'll find that the uh, corner frequency for the two parts are different. So for the 8698, it has a 50 hertz corner, whereas the 8691 has a 200 hertz corner. So if you had a low bandwidth measurement, obviously the 8698 would be a better choice than uh, the 8691. And there's, by the way, there's actually a, a reason for this. Uh, the 8698 is in a um, precision bipolar process, uh, so it's optimized for low 1 over F noise, whereas the 8691 is in a CMOS process, and CMOS processes tend to have a higher uh, 1 over F corner. So that's the reason that you see this difference here. So make sure that you go pick an amplifier for your job. Uh, something that's even a lot worse than what you see here is if you had said had a uh, you know 500 megahertz amplifier, some really high speed amplifier. They may have one, uh, one over F corners of of uh, 10 kilohertz, 5 kilohertz, something like that. Much worse than you see here. The other thing that you can do is instead of looking at the plots you can compare microvolts peak to peak numbers. So uh, in our precision data sheets, we always have this 0.1 to 10 hertz number peak to peak. And the reason that we have it is to give you an idea of what the 1 over F performance of the amplifier is. Uh, so lo and behold, if you go look at these, the numbers of these two parts, you'd find the 8698 has a 0.6 uh, microvolts peak to peak, and it's better than the 8691. Um, for our high-speed amplifiers, we don't even bother to spec uh, this number because the number would not be good. So if you are looking at a amplifier data sheet and they do not spec the 0.1 to 10 hertz uh, microvolt speak to peak number, then you can be pretty sure that it's pretty bad. Uh, you can you, know, you can go look at the if they've got a voltage noise density plot. You can go check that out too, just to make sure. Um, Another thing you can do if you're doing a low bandwidth uh, uh, system is that you can use an auto zero or chopper type topology. So these have these topologies have no or very low one over F noise, and these are a very good choice if you have very low bandwidth. Now, typically these topologies have